Although deaths in childhood have reduced markedly over the last 40 to 50 years, there are still more than 4,500 children who die in England and Wales every year. Many more children are living with chronic complex conditions that may shorten their lives and who would benefit from input from children's palliative care services. This is Martin House Children's Hospice in Boston Spa in West Yorkshire. When Martin House opened its doors in 1987, it became only the second children's hospice in the UK, the first being Helen House in Oxford. Palliative care services for children have developed over the last 35 years in the UK. This has very much been on a local basis, with heavy reliance on individual clinicians, families and charities, including children's hospices. We now have about 10 hospital-based paediatric palliative care teams in the NHS and 53 children's hospices in the UK. These children's hospices on average receive about 20% of their funding from the government. Adult hospices receive about 33% of their funding from the government. Is palliative care for children really less important? Martin House has been involved in research for many years and I myself have worked with them on studies they've funded since 2008. In general, however, there is a real dearth of high quality research in this topic area. We're delighted in 2016 when the Board of Trustees at Martin House agreed to fund a bold and ambitious programme of research in partnership with the University of York, the Martin House Research Centre. This, the vision was that this research centre will undertake high quality research of national and international significance that will make a difference to the lives of these children and families. The funding of Martin House Research Centre came shortly after we just completed a study commissioned by the Scottish Government, Children in Scotland Requiring Palliative Care, Identifying Numbers and Needs. This study showed there was many more children living in Scotland with life-limiting conditions that may shorten their lives. And as part of the study, we produced 10 key policy recommendations for the Scottish Government. These were mainly around access to palliative care services for children, particularly babies, those under one, and teenagers and young adults. But we also made recommendations about the psychosocial support care needs of their families. This report was part of the evidence that went to the Scottish Government that resulted in two key impacts. Firstly, the strategic framework for palliative and end-of-life care in Scotland committed to the development of children's palliative care for the first time. Secondly, the Scottish Government committed to invest £30 million over the next five years in the further development of children's palliative care. Given that the population of Scotland is almost identical to the population of Yorkshire and Humber, this is a significant investment. We have the Chief Executive of Martin House here today and I can guarantee he would be doing cartwheels around the front here if we had that sort of an investment um, in Yorkshire and Humber. Feel free, Martin, if you, um, if you wish to. We have seen... Um, this investment come to fruition recently in Scotland, just before Christmas, a partnership between Children's Hospice Association Scotland and the Royal Hospital for Children in Glasgow launched their first hospital-based supportive and palliative care team. Research can make a difference. There are growing numbers of children with life-limiting conditions. You can see in this graph here, it's high, higher prevalence than the under ones, but in all age groups of children, these are increasing. This is predominantly down to the fact that these children are being treated more often with medical technologies such as artificial feeding tubes, home ventilation and more aggressive management of complications such as infections. Some recent work we did um, showed that these children accounted for about approximately 58% of all admissions to paediatric intensive care units in the UK. This is resulting in these children surviving longer, often into adulthood, something that would have been unheard of 20, 25 years ago, but this has a real impact on services. These children have a very wide range of underlying diagnoses. Less than 20% have cancer. Much more common is more complex conditions affecting the brain and nervous system, genetic conditions or congenital conditions present from birth. We do have national clinical guidelines on palliative care for children and young people in the UK. They make 143 recommendations about these care, but the vast majority of these recommendations are based on expert opinion or low quality research evidence. I feel this lack of high quality research evidence is a real risk. Just because we're trying to do good doesn't mean that we're not doing harm. We need evidence of both. There are currently huge issues with funding, with several children's hospices in the UK at risk of closure. 
Therefore, it's important that we can understand how best to design and develop services in the most effective and efficient way so that more children can benefit from these care. As I said, I've been working in this area since around 2008. And what has been really nice to see is the real engagement of the sector over that time period. I must admit, to start with, people were very apprehensive about the concept of research in this topic area. I think I was allowed to do it because I was a paediatrician and that was kind of all right, but they were very scared about what we were going to say and what we might find out. Things have really changed and we've been working a lot with the hospice sector and with the, and with the NHS. And this is evidenced recently by a survey that we had undertaken about the care of a child after they've died in children's hospices and we had nearly 80% of the children's hospices respond to that survey. Research funding is competitive and children's palliative care is often not a priority for many of our research funders. However, since the start of the Martin House Centre, we've got four studies funded by the National Institute for Health Research, the main government body for funding health research in England. These studies include um, studies looking at the transition from children's to adult services, something that our parents talk about as falling off a cliff edge. We have a study starting in the next few months looking at the role of chaplaincy services in the NHS. One of these studies I feel very passionately about is about the health of um, parents of child with a life-limiting condition. We now have this expectation that if your child is diagnosed with a very complex and chronic medical condition, that you become a healthcare provider as well as a parent. That must have an impact on both your mental and physical health. And this study is looking both to quantify these, uh, these impacts, but also to try and work out how best healthcare can provide support to these parents and families. We wouldn't have been able to get any of these external funding had it not been from the baseline funding from Martin House. Much of the research that we're doing is um, national studies, but it's also really important that we continue to work with local and regional services. In Yorkshire and Humber, we have four children's hospice organisations, you can see highlighted in pink there. We have two specialist children's hospitals, one in Leeds, one in Sheffield. And we also have 14 district general hospitals that also care for children. Unfortunately, we don't have one of the 10 specialist paediatric palliative care hospital teams in Yorkshire and Humber. All these organisations are working together under the umbrella of the Yorkshire and Humber Children's Palliative Care Network. And this network is, all, is piloting a new service specification for NHS England and is being held up as um, leading the way for trying to provide 24 hour a day, seven day a week palliative care services for children. I managed to persuade NHS England that doing a formal evaluation of this would be very helpful so we could share our um, learning in a systematic way to the other regions of the UK as they start to develop their own services. Working closely with key policy makers such as NHS England is enabling us to contribute to getting a more integrated approach to care for these children. The Martin House Research Centre now has a team of 11. In the three years since we started, we've completed four studies. We have 11 ongoing and two due to start. These range from large population level studies looking at data collected in hospitals to in-depth interview studies of parents about the early days after their child has died. I can't tell you about all of them, but I will mention a few in the next slides. Our approach to research is collaborative and multidisciplinary. We need experts in many different topic areas and in many different research methods. It's really important that we have all our key partners involved from the point of planning a study, not just when we have the results to share. And these are partners include clinicians and service providers such as hospices, but they also include the parents and young people themselves. We have a very active family advisory board and young persons group who help advise us on individual studies and also about the strategy of the research centre. Our parents are very good at telling us how we could do things better and particularly to stop being so paternalistic. We worry a lot about research adding an additional burden to these families, but they are very clear they want to be the ones to decide whether they want to be involved in research or not. They don't want other people making that decision for them. These families have been instrumental in some of our successful um, studies to date. When we had some initial stakeholder work about what were the important research questions for us to be undertaking, something that was raised by the young people was concerns over the staff that cared for them and their well-being. 
issue over workforce in children's palliative care has also been raised recently by the National Charity um, for Children's Palliative Care Together for Short Lives. Their survey showed that on average children's hospices have a nursing vacancy rate of more than 12% and two thirds of these vacancies are empty for more than three months. My colleague Joe Taylor is leading a study called Staff Wellbeing in Children's Hospices. And this study aims to understand the work-related stressors and rewards about working in a children's hospice, and also to identify support systems and organisational practices that offer the most potential to enhance well-being at work. This study is ongoing, um, but the, what, some of the um, unique features that have come out in the first phase is that the concept of being able to provide a good end-of-life care for a child is a key reward of a children's hospice. And relating back to what I said earlier, one unique stressor is the issue around funding and the reliability on charity funding. The impact of having a child with a life-threatening condition affects a whole family, and we're currently doing studies looking at the health and well-being of mothers and fathers. But one of our, one of our PhD students was particularly interested in the support provided to siblings. This photograph here of Joseph and Eve Joseph died in 2017 from a rare form of childhood cancer. His mum, Sarah, is a very active member of our family advisory board. There are support programmes for siblings like Eve where their brother or sister has cancer. And when our student collated all the evidence on this, they showed in general there was positive effects on siblings like Eve. But there were very few studies that have looked at, looked at the evidence and there was very few support programmes for children whose brother or sister had a different condition who, other than cancer. Whilst there is a focus on um, managing the very complex physical symptoms that go along with these underlying conditions, the psychological needs of both the children and parents have been highlighted recently in several key policy documents. Mary Barker, another of our PhD students, is looking at levels of anxiety and depression in children with life-limiting conditions. When she's collated and summarised the research evidence to date, she showed that overall there was um, an anxiety prevalence of 19% and a depression prevalence of 14% in this population. This is much higher than the general population prevalence in children, which is seen in the dotted red line here. This really highlights the need for psychological assessment and monitoring in this population. The study also raised another issue in that most of the studies have been done in populations such as children with cancer where they're developmentally and cognitively normal and it's relatively easy to assess symptoms of anxiety and depression. But there were very few studies in children with the larger population of children with very complex um, or progressive neurological conditions. Therefore, the next stage of Mary's work is going to be looking at data collected routinely in general practice and in hospital to try and estimate the levels of anxiety and depression in the broader population of children and young people with life-limiting conditions. I said earlier that parents are one of our key partners, and you can see this quote from Kirsty, one of our brave parents who is a member of our family advisory board, that she really feels we do listen to and act on their advice and uh -huh. input. This is so important. They are the experts in this topic area. The work of the whole team of the Martin House Research Centre is opening the door to research in this area. <coughs> The bold and ambitious investment from Martin House has enabled us to develop a wide-ranging portfolio of research, leverage further external funding and work closely with policymakers and start to make a difference to children with life-limiting conditions and their families. Thank you.